grace. Let's all stand together. Happy 4th of July week. Hope everybody gets Tuesday off. I want to invite you to sing a couple songs with us this morning. We worship. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Cause we were the beggars and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were, we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing it out, there is joy. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We can celebrate with joy because of this truth. Sing it out. That we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise.
worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You work in, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you work even when I don't feel it, you work you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you work even when I don't feel it, you work never stop. Never stop working. You never stop. You never stop. We make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are maker, miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, one more time. Cause you are waymaker, 
Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Let's rest in that truth. You are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. I give myself, 
I give myself to you. We sing to you, God, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. Father, here we are. Give ourselves to you. Thank you for taking us as we are, for loving us as we are. Thank you, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace, thank you so much for singing with us. You guys can be seated. All right, guys. Well, my name is Derek, and um, we are in part two of a series called Better, uh, because we all want better, right? Don't we all want better in life? Um, for those who weren't with us uh, last week, we, uh, we kicked off the series with, uh, with this idea that Jesus makes life better, which is what the um, letters on this t-shirt stand for. Jesus makes life better. We talked about that last week and, uh, and we issued a challenge. And the challenge uh, involves the Grace Community Church app. And by the way, if you don't have the app, you gotta download it. It's a free download. You can reach into the seat pocket right in front of you. And I encourage you to do that right now. It's, it's great because that way you'll have something to do if, uh, if Matt's uh, sermon today gets a little bit boring. Um, it'll be great. You just, you got the app ready to go. Um, boom, roasted. Um, so uh, he got me and you'll, you'll, you'll hear in a minute. Anyway, um, so... Here's the deal. Why, why we have this app, one of the great features of the app is something called the daily. And it's three things. It's gratitude, prayer, and Bible reading. And, um, and what we basically said last week, we kicked off this challenge. We said, we believe Jesus makes your life better. And, uh, and if you will take the next seven days to go through the daily, um, we will give you this t-shirt. Um, and I'm just curious, um, who successfully completed a seven-day streak in the app? Raise your hand. Be proud if you completed the streak. Let me see. Yes, yeah, some hands up here. We had, we had a number of people who did it. Good for you guys. That's awesome. Um, be patient with us. We've got to get the analytics from the app team, the developers, and then, and then we'll be in contact with you with the code, and you can get the right fit of T-shirt that you need, and, and you'll be getting hooked up with, with one of these. This, by the way, is actually the shirt that um, I preached in last week. I did do laundry, so this is clean. Okay, this is clean. I'm just curious, is there anybody who you, you, you tried, like you set, you were like, I'm gonna do the streak, but something happened and you weren't able to complete the streak and you're kind of broken up about it. You're like, man, I really wanted a t-shirt, but I wasn't able to get the t-shirt. All right, so uh, leave your hand up for a second. Uh, leave your hand up, there we go. So uh, let me see if I can get this to my man right there. There it is, baby, there it is. Um, so... Um, I'm at least able to, to redeem one person's week, okay? But for those of you who were like, man, I really wanted that t-shirt. It's a cool t-shirt. Um, we are going to start the challenge again this week. So you've got a shot at redemption, all right? You got a shot at redemption. It starts today. For the next seven days, I want to encourage you every day, go through the daily. It just takes a couple of minutes and, um, and you can get that t-shirt. But here's, here's the deeper reason why we're doing this, okay? Don't, don't miss this. It's because we fundamentally believe that if you will take the beginning part of your day and you will focus in on Jesus and his teachings for you, that your life is going to be better. That's what we want for you. Um, I want to share with you an email I got from, uh, from someone at Grace. Her name is Stephanie. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole email. You can read it there. But what she talked about, with the, what she discovered with the daily, is it's a winner of a routine builder. You guys see that? It's, a, it's just it's a great way to start your day. And that's what we want for you. We just, we, especially what, what Matt's going to share today, he's talking about better fun and, uh, and what that looks like. And I'm telling you, um, th this is an amazing way to, to lean into what, what Matt's going to share with us in today's message. So it's great to see you guys this morning. Welcome to Grace. You got me.
Good morning, everybody. My name's Matt. Today we're talking about better fun. Uh, first question I have this morning is this. Does anybody in the room like to have fun? Yeah. Okay, we like fun. Yeah. Fun is life. Um, just out of curiosity, what, what do we like to do for fun? I just want to get to know the room. What, what do we like to do for fun? Anybody? Travel. Travel. Traveling is super fun. See new places. Skydiving. Okay. Sounds scary. Mario Brothers. Yes. Super fun. Oh my gosh, me too. What about over here? Shopping. Shopping. Super fun. You find the good deals. Dancing. Yeah. All good fun. Yes. Great. Great fun. Really good fun. Hey, question. Um, does anybody in the room think that a roast is fun? Like a, not like a pig roast, like a, make some jokes about somebody fun, like have a little laughing. A little, okay, would anybody be interested in just like a little mini baby like pastoral roast? Just, just to have a little bit of fun this morning, okay? I mean, it's what I planned, so here we go. Um, I'm going to start with John. He's the, he's the lead guy. So, um, so John, I don't know where you are. John, wherever you are, you write two kinds of sermons. The kind that's short and to the point, and then the kind you actually preach. Boom, Roasted. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I got one for Derek, too. Derek's, Derek's right here. Derek, if you don't know Derek, Derek is our executive pastor here at Grace. And by executive pastor, I mean Derek wanders around getting in everybody else's business. Okay. In Derek's defense, though, he did say he'll start doing real work as soon as the Cincinnati Bengals win a Super Bowl. So, boom. Double roasted. Yeah. I roasted you and your team. Okay. Honestly... That, that was fun for me. I think that's really fun. Um, but I recognize that that was not fun for everybody because that was fun at someone else's expense. And, uh, and that's, nah, that's not the best kind of fun. There is better fun. But what it does for me is highlight a unique challenge of this message today. And that's this craft a message that's deeply meaningful for everyone in a room where there are very, very different ideas about what fun is and what it means to have fun. So I'm going to let Psalm 37 do the work. I think that in, in the first four verses of Psalm 37, there is a really powerful unlock for all of us as we seek to grow our capacity for the best kind of fun, for better fun. There is a surprising secret in Psalm 37 Let's jump right in. Um, this is a Psalm of David. David is the, the most famous king of the nation of Israel. Um, and, uh, and David writes this. He says this, Psalm 37, uh, one through four, starting in verse one. David says this. He says, do not get upset because of evildoers. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. So signal number one, that there's something for us we can lean into. Because the question is, well, why would I even be envious of wrongdoers? Well, because on the surface, it's the wrongdoers who seem like they're having the most fun. Okay, they, like cue Billy Joel, right? Only the good die young. You know the lyric, fill in the blanks. I'd rather laugh with the, than die, than cry with the, because the sinners have much more. Right, come on, an idea that is uh, very popular today. It's just uh, observational data. True for us today. True for King David, as he was processing the world around him. Look, these people who are, are not my people, looks like in some ways, man, they're having so much more fun. He's reflecting on that. He says, this, do not be envious of that. Um, there's something better. There's something better just around the corner. David continues, verse two, do not be envious of them for, for they will wither quickly like the grass and decay like the green plants. So like, there's something about their fun that is fleeting. There's something about their life and their experience that is missing something. It's not, it's not full. It's not actual life. The best word to describe it, it was what's going to happen is decay. So it's not the best kind of fun. Let's unlock a pathway to something better. Verses three and four, David writes this. Trust in the Lord and do good. Live in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Okay, so ultimately, here is what the first four verses of Psalm 37 is saying for us. This is our major unlock as we seek to pursue better fun. It's this. There is a direct link 
between the having the highest levels of contentment and experiencing as a fruit of your contentment better fun. Like in other words, if I can get the contentment piece of my life figured out first, primary, then what I will experience as a fruit of that is better fun. This is a key idea. This idea that contentment is the pathway to the best fun. Okay, it's the pathway to the best fun is not, uh, it's not technology, it's not the latest thing, it's not how much I can spend, it's not that. The pathway to the best fun is contentment. Okay, this is a key idea, and, and really it's worth recognizing that oftentimes we live with a different idea, a, an opposite idea that says actually the pathway to contentment is having the, the best fun. Like in other words, like, oh, if I could just have more fun, I'll be more content. If I can just have better kinds of fun, I will be a more satisfied person. I will have a more satisfied soul. What Psalm 37 is saying is it's the opposite. It's an inverse relationship between contentment and fun. And it's about getting the contentment piece figured out first. Let the fun come as a fruit of that. So here's what I really want to do this morning is I want to link what we see in Psalm 37 to what we see in the very first pages of Genesis, Genesis 1, Genesis 2 and 3, the the origin accounts, the origin stories in the beginning pages of Genesis are an incredible backdrop for us to get at what David is saying as he's leading the nation of Israel. They're living in the promised land at that point in their nation's history. He's He's reflecting on like, what does it mean to live in the land and cultivate faithfulness? Well, there's some really important ideas that, uh, that harken back to in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that David is actually coming out of. And I think it's gonna be really helpful for us when we think about, okay, well, what does this actually look like for me to live in the land and cultivate faithfulness here and now, live in this land and cultivate faithfulness as a pathway to contentment and as a, ultimately a pathway to experience the best kind of fun. So um, we, I wanna link to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And just so you, we're all on the same page, if you're, if you're not a church person, you haven't been around, you probably still heard these origin stories, okay? And what I'm talking about in the first three chapters of Genesis are these origin stories where, where God is ordering our, our world, right? These famous lines of, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and he speaks, and, the, and there's light, and, and you have these days where on one of the days, God is separating the waters from above from the waters from below, and God is separating the waters from the land, and, and God is ordering the world and God is putting plants in the ground and, and all this stuff. So you have this origin story. Then you have a second origin story, actually, in the first couple chapters. It's very similar in some of its themes, but a little bit different in a lot of important ways. But the focus is a garden that God is creating. And then there's these first humans that God says, okay, here you go, plunk in the garden. And, um, and here's, here's what we see. In, in the first couple chapters of Genesis, Genesis that I, I want to wrap my mind around because it's going to be really helpful for us. Okay, one, major ideas in the origin stories of Genesis. Okay, one, that our world is one, ordered, two, it's on purpose, and three, it is, what, what was the third one? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's ordered, it's on purpose, and it's good, it's ordered, it's on purpose, and on good. So this is what, what scripture is establishing for us, that this world is ordered on purpose and good. Now, on top of that, our world that is ordered on purpose and good is given to us as humans as a gift. It's a gift that we're meant to receive, to enjoy, to live in, to inhabit, to cultivate, to explore, to adventure around on, because it's beautiful and amazing. Has anybody watched anything on the National Geographic channel lately? Or do we just stop doing that when we leave elementary school? Okay, this world is incredible, right? It's beautiful. And it was given to us after being ordered and purposed and, and claimed as good. It was given to us as a gift for us to enjoy. Okay, now, one final thing we see in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 when it comes to this world that's been given to us as a gift, that there are really two ways for us to inhabit it. And in Genesis 2 and 3, we we find that there are two ways to inhabit this gift. One, in a way that is healthy and sustainable and for all intents and purposes, on board with God and the dreams God had for all of this. In the way that we maintain our relationships, in the way that we um, enjoy and, and preserve the earth. 
That's way number one. And then what we also see in, in the first chapters of Genesis is that there's another way to inhabit this earth. It's the very much opposite way. It's a way that's not as healthy or sustainable and is not on board with God and God's dreams for this creation, but it actually disrupts God's dreams for this creation. It is in opposition to what God had in mind for this ordered, purposed, good, incredible world that was given to us as a gift. So a couple things, and, and here's how we're going to tie this back to Psalm 37. One, in verse one of Psalm 37, what David says is, do not be envious of the evildoer, or do, do not get upset because of the evildoers, do not be envious of wrongdoers. Well, just a quick note on what, who David is talking about here. This word for evildoer that David uses is the Hebrew word ra'ah. Okay, and, and if you're curious, it, what it literally means is to be someone who breaks good things, a breaker of what is good. And what's really interesting about this word is that oftentimes it is used as an opposite to the Hebrew word taman, which to be taman means to be whole, to be a whole person. So what David is describing is he's describing the people who, because they're not whole people, because they don't have the contentment piece of their life figured out, they don't have this, this, this soul, the satisfied piece of their life figured out, they live in ways that break what's good. I mean, to, to bring it back, I, I imagine my son Caleb in his room spending all this time, hours in his room, building with his Legos this incredible city and you know, cars and all this, it's so good. And then his little sister, Kendall, who, because she's got some kind of missing chip, she walks in and just breaks it. <laughs> right? She is an evildoer. She is, uh, she's being raw. So just to put it in perspective, like so much of this understanding what David is after here depends on we understand the world to be good and to receive as a gift. And now, and, and fast forward, and this is really the, the second main, main point here. David says in verse three, he says, trust in the Lord and do good. Live in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Now, here's what David is reflecting on. One, he has a unique opportunity at his exact moment in time, leading his nation to, to do just that. See, what, what David and his people had experienced is God has given to them a land that is a gift, that was good, where they are meant to thrive and be in relationship with each other and be in relationship with God, this whole promised land, right? And what we see in Genesis 1 is the humans, the archetypal humans, the Adam and the Eve, the, the, the human and the life, what they were given is the gift of a garden where they were meant to thrive and enjoy and adventure and be in relationship with each other and be in relationship with God. So everything hinges on this, this idea that can I, can I live in a place that was given to me as a gift in this understanding that everything I need to be satisfied has been given to me and be okay with that? Can, can I do that? In, in another way to put it is this, like the whether or not they succeeded at this boils down to pretty much one thing. And it's exactly what David is talking about. How do we do it? It means that I'm able to recognize that everything that has been given to me is a gift from a generous God. And it's all I need to be satisfied. And I, and I don't need anything outside of that. And then I can let that, that firm conviction guide my living. Another way to think about it is, am I good with knowing God to be basically a generous giver of all good things. And if God is the generous giver, then that means I am nothing more than a grateful recipient of good gifts and live in that dynamic. Okay. One more really important idea. If I, if I can come to terms with that, if I can come to terms with this, this idea that, that David was reflecting on that, hey, as a nation, Israel we're living in this land that is a gift for us and we've been given every good thing by God. It's the promised land. It's plentiful. It's, it's meant to satisfy us and we don't need anything outside of it. And, and, and hearkening back to Adam and Eve in this garden is a gift like, hey, Adam, Eve, like we've been given this gift that is a garden. Everything we need is to be satisfied is given to us and we don't need anything outside of it. If, if, I, can, if I can be there, if I can wrestle with that to the ground and be good at that, it is gonna, that is going to protect us. It's going to protect us from the errors we see 
by David later in his reign and the errors we see by the humans in the garden. Namely, the error of, while I've been given every good thing I need to be satisfied, at some point along the line, I get to a place where I decide, actually, it's not enough. What I've been given as a gift is it's not enough. Something inside of me or something outside of me tells me that I need, I need more. And then when that happens, what, what we do is we see, we see what happened in Genesis, in the garden. And the humans decide, well, what God has given us is not enough. I need to go outside of this giving, receiving dynamic that God has for my thriving, and I need to take. And I need to be a taker. And because what God has given me is not enough, I need to live in a way where I see something good and I take it. And and we can allow our imaginations to lead us in seeing how this disrupts a good world that God has given us. And how the entire, okay, let's get really serious for a minute here, like how the entire history of human pain and suffering and depravity is born when humans step outside of a life where every good thing they have is a gift from a generous God and it's enough. Our history of war and poverty and inequality is rooted in human inability just to be satisfied with what God gives and our decision to go outside of that and to take. For the humans in the garden, it was the fruit of a tree they decided they needed to take. For David, as king of Israel, it was one of his friend's wives he decided to take. For humans throughout history. It's land. It's this. It's that. It's resources. It's, hey, I am not good at this whole thing where I would be satisfied with the good gift that God has given me. And I'm so sad. And I've got to go and I've got to take other things that I think I see are good. It's just, it's pain. So here, here's the question. What would our world look like? What would your life look like? What would our world look, look, look like if as a human race, we actually got good at the being satisfied thing? We got the contentment piece of our lives figured out. If we decided we're just not gonna go out and take whatever it is we think looks good, but we can exist in a place where we're satisfied with what God gives us, we can look at that. We can look at what we've been given and we can say, It's enough. It's enough. This links to our visions for the future of equality and justice. It links to our visions for how we alleviate poverty. This is how we get to God's dreams for, for creation where there are not haves and have nots because the ones who have the means and the power to, to take, they don't because they're living with souls that are satisfied. Okay, bring this all to a close. Okay, this message is about better fun. Scripture says, if I want better fun, I've got to get the contentment piece of my life figured out. Psalm 37 says, it begins by just going back to square one, going back to a decision to live simply as a grateful recipient of every good thing God gives me. And it begins with the decision to reject any attempt anyone has to convince me that what God has given me isn't enough. The stats say that you're actually exposed to over 4,000 advertisements a day, which means that per day, almost 4,000 times, someone's trying to convince you that what you have isn't enough. That's tough. So we need to, so here's the call to action. Let's figure out how we can be living in like an active rebellion against this bent I have for discontentment. Okay, we're, and, and really what we're gonna, where we're going to go is spiritual disciplines. And this is what they are. Spiritual disciplines, like disciplines of silence, disciplines of fasting, disciplines of Sabbath. What all these are, most simply put, is these are, at, these are me actively rebelling against my bent toward discontentment. That thing inside of me that says, what, what I have, starting with the breath in my lungs, isn't enough. So I, I started on a, a journey of this um, this past year. Um, at the end of 2022, I issued a challenge to all of my youth leaders on our team that work with the youth group. Like, hey, think, pray about what is one word God has for you for 2023? Listen, for what is it? What is like one word for 2023 that you're gonna claim and I'm gonna pray alongside you all year and, and we're gonna talk about it. And because I asked them to do it, I had to do it myself. And so I'm praying about this. And, and, the, and the thing that God really impressed upon me to, to make a central focus of 2023 is this idea of Sabbath, of rest. This, this way of being in active rebellion against my bent toward discontentment because I'm taking a day and I'm saying I'm not, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to resist the thing inside of me that says do more, achieve more, acquire more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to resist that just by taking a Sabbath one day a week. And so as a starting place, I like, okay, let me lean back into the spiritual disciplines. I went out and actually, no, this book was given to me as a gift. And um, I'm going to put a picture of it here on the screen. It's by John Mark Comer. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Okay, it's a fantastic book. Uh, really, really helpful. Um, if, if you want to get serious about growing your capacity to reject that bent inside of you that says you, you need more, right? So three of the main spiritual disciplines that are going to be covered in this book are silence and fasting and Sabbath. And so I read this book. I started practicing silence. Here's, and this is kind of one story to bring everything to a close and what this kind of looks like for me or what it has looked like for me is um, I, uh, I started practicing silence in the morning. So I wake up before I like go for a run or do whatever. I go out back and if the weather's right, I'll go out back. If the weather's not right, I'll try to find a place inside. But out back is my, my favorite place and I'll sit down and I'll start just by several slow, deep breaths. Several slow, deep breaths. And then from there, just recite some, some prayer language that I picked up along the way. For me, it's, May my soul, and this is a prayer to God, may my soul rise to meet you as the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the Father, to the Son, to the Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. And then I say, speak, Lord, your son is listening. And then, I'm, and then I sit there in silence. And it's really interesting um, what happens. And by interesting, um, in terms of what happens, I mean nothing, because nothing happens. Like you sit there. To be honest, when you start this process, it's just like nothing. Okay, this is great. Um, but, but what I noticed is it, after a, a few moments and some more breaths, what I start to become aware of is sounds. You start to hear the, the wind rustling in the leaves and you start to hear the birds chirping and you start to become acutely aware of the sound of your breath. And all of a sudden right there, you have a whole bunch of things to be grateful for, which is powerful in and of itself. But now... Um, one, one time, uh, this is a really cool thing that happened. I actually have a video for what happened. I shouldn't have had my phone out there with me. It was a, 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 a flaw in my strategy that morning to, to practice silence. But this morning, I had a, halfway into my time of silence, I look up and I see these, these bunnies doing this. Anybody, anybody ever see bunnies do this? I showed somebody, I showed somebody this. It, look how much fun they're having. Look at this. Somebody came up to me after first service and said, you know, that's called binking? I'm like, what? okay. A lot of collective knowledge in this room, in this church. Um, look, I just, I just got to tell you, I had so much fun watching these little guys play. It was amazing. And like, I, I, I feel so stupid, like being so emphatic about how fun this was. But it was great. And, and also I, I bring that up to say, this is a picture of what we're after. This is the best kind of fun. Why? Because it was fun that I was able to receive as a gift that morning from God. It was like, I interpret that as God saying, Matt, I got something fun for you today. And, and I got to experience it from a place of silence and contentment and active rebellion against that bent inside of me that says I need more and I'm not satisfied. I went and I got quiet and I was like, okay, focus on, and then God's like, man, I got something fun for you. It wasn't the kind of fun that I went out in pursuit of because I thought it would, it would lead me to more contentment. It, there wasn't anything riding on this fun. There wasn't any opportunity for me to say, I'm going to go chase this fun and I might be disappointed in it, which happens all the time. No, it was like, no, I didn't have to chase it. It was given to me as a gift. That's what we're after. Look, uh, the challenge is this. Let's get serious about increasing our capacity to reject any lie from inside of us or outside of us that says, well, what God has given us is not enough. Let's do it. Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, incredible book, great starting point. Find a community group to read it with or just a couple friends, okay? And then... Um, there's another fun challenge. I thought I've actually brought it up in staff meeting this week. I forgot to talk about it first service, but hey, try this. Try going to a mall. Try going to the place where you are most inundated with companies trying to tell you that what you have is not enough and walk that mall and look at everything you see. And every time you see something, say out loud to yourself, I don't need that. 
I don't need that. You're literally walking through the mall looking like kind of a weirdo, but just talking to yourself, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. Look, you are building a spiritual muscle to resist the lie of anything that says what you have is not enough. And when you're watching TV, right? Like live TV. It's not like Netflix because there's no commercials. But like when you're watching a sports game or anything else on live TV and commercials come up, before every commercial is over, say out loud to the room, to yourself, I don't need that. Because chances are you don't. I mean, there's gonna be some exceptions in the room, okay? Yeah, like I need that medication that they're, you know, selling. I, I, I don't know, okay. I didn't need to go there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you get the point. Let's, um, let's, let's tie it just by repeating the main idea. Look, so often we live like, like it's fun that's gonna lead us to a most satisfied life, and it's not. It's about wrestling with the contentment piece of our life that's gonna lead us to the best fun. Let's, let's do it, okay? Let me pray for us. Lord, um, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the way you, you led David years ago to reflect on his experience with you and his experience in the promised land. Um, we're so grateful to be able to reflect on it this morning. Our prayer is that you would help us. Lord, we need you. If we're gonna grow in this way, spirit, we need you. We can't do it on our own. We need your presence in our lives. We need you to open our eyes to see your glory and all the ways that you have provided for us and that you are enough. Help us, help us to live with satisfied souls in your presence and in relationship with you. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Matt, for that message. We appreciate that. Uh, that was good, man. That was good. I uh, received that. So, um, so just a, a great reminder to all of us, right? Fun doesn't lead to contentment. Contentment leads to fun. And um, I don't know about you, but man, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge, and, and we can all agree that that's a great uh, fundamental truth, but then we walk out of here, and, and it's, a, it's a struggle, right? So um, just want to remind you again, we have created this resource, this Grace app, the daily, and, uh, and if you take us up on this challenge to go through and create this uh, seven-day streak, this habit, um, it's going to help you to practice contentment. It's going to help you to be more content in your life. It's going to help you to find more fun through that contentment. And so just want to offer one more time that challenge to you. Hope you, hope you take us up on that today. Um, so just a couple of reminders to you. Um, if, if you would like prayer for anything at all, or maybe there's someone in your life and they, you want someone to pray for them, our prayer team is right under that screen right over there. Uh, our team would love to pray for you or with you. And, uh, and if you're new to Grace, um, I would love to, to meet you and just shake your hand and, and say hi to you. We do something called Grace in Five. It takes five minutes right under that screen over there. And then one final thing, you guys. Um, since it is um, July 4th, just in a couple of days from now, um, we thought it would be cool to uh, just, just in honor of all of our members of the military, both active duty and veterans and your families, as a way to say thank you, we have a little reception in the, the room right next to the coffee bar. We just would love for you to stop by uh, right now and, um, and just connect with some other families and also just so that we could, we could pray over you. So um, yeah, just thank you for your service to our nation and um, just want to say thanks to everybody. Uh, God bless you guys and have an amazing week. Take care.